good evening and welcome back to Po Discussions with Carmen and Jeannie. Jeannie, how are you tonight? I'm doing well. It is a Thursday night and it's not Monday, so it's great. That, that is exactly <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> and I'm doing very well because this is my second week with summer break from school and so loving life right now. So we no, have a... Very special guest tonight, Sarah Palmer is with us. And so Sarah, if you'll just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, hi everybody. Uh, I am Sarah Palmer, AKA Pinna Palmer, AKA Gwen Gooley, for those who know me on that area. Um, I am a horror lover. I have been since I was a kid. I have my own YouTube channel that's very dedicated to vintage, pink and spooky. I'm on a TV show on MeTV as a horror guest host or, I don't know, a sidekick host uh, on the Sven Gulli show for those who are a fan of horror hosting and horror comedy to make fun of it, like Mystery Science Theater or Elvira. Um, and I love everything vintage, tiki. I work at Universal Studios where horror was made. I play the Bride of Frankenstein. And yeah, my life is literally just Halloween 24 seven, every day. <laughs> that That is amazing and awesome. <laughs> That's Absolutely. Fun. Yeah, we we get to enjoy, I guess, Halloween through October and sometimes September as well. I kind of start decorating early. Um, we okay. did a an event, let's see, was it two years ago, halfway to Halloween in May. And so that was a lot of fun. So uh, I feel like Halloween's just creeping up every month, just a little bit. Halloween it, in January. <laughs> and, oh, I know. I know. It the um decorations in stores are coming out so much earlier yeah. now than ever. I've already so, seen some I think at Michaels or Joanne's. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The fever. Yes. <laughs> and, and and if I was gonna say I always have the fever for that kind of stuff. Okay. So <laughs> tell tell us like um like uh, your work at Universal, Bride of Frankenstein, and just some of the other things that you do there. And so I started working at Universal when I was 18. Okay. Um, I am now 32. So I've given, I've given Universal Studios like pretty much all of my twenties, my youth. Yeah. <laughs> <They> so <laughs> and um, right. yeah. And I first started, uh, the first things I did there was Halloween Horror Nights. Um, so it's right. this Halloween event where they scare you and they take you through mazes and stuff. And I liked it so much. I was like, what else do you guys got? They're like, oh, we got a thing called Grinchmas, which is a event that's dedicated to the Jim Carrey version of the Grinch from Dr. Seuss's. Okay. And I was like, sure, I'll audition for that. Got that. And then I, I guess I got, I don't know, I got the fever for working at Universal Studios. So I wanted to work there full time. So I auditioned for everything that I could. And eventually wound up as a Helen in Waterworld as the stunt show. Marilyn oh, Monroe, cool. Fiona, uh, did Grinchmas again, did Halloween Horror Nights again, um, and found my way through the years to finally The Bride of Frankenstein. Oh, wow. She, um, and I got rid of all the other characters. I'm done. because I'm slowly starting to step away from Universal. Okay. Uh, okay. But I knew I wanted to keep one character and... It was the bride. I mean, who who doesn't want to just hiss at people all day? Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, like oh. Silent characters are the best. Um, so I, I love playing her, and uh, she's probably one of my favorite characters ever. It's kind of awesome to play a universal character, too, because all the other characters are just kind of um, rented out. Like, Marilyn never worked for Universal. We like right. to say she, yeah. Yeah, she was a Fox girl. She was an MGM girl. That, that never happened. Uh, but to finally play a character that's like universal made um, is really cool. Really neat. Nostalgic. Yeah, ab yeah. absolutely. Jeannie, yeah, it's been what, yeah, Jeannie, what questions do you have? Well, talking about universal and I have, I've been to the Florida universal horror nights, the Halloween and all that kind of thing. It It's spectacular because it, it just, it speaks to people who like that genre. Mm -hmm. So, and you oh. talked about how you started basically at a young age of 18 into that world. So what kind of 
uh, other things has drawn you to horror as a genre, not just working at Universal and being in that thing, but before that, what was so spectacular? And you talk about how you, the pinup, every time you pin up Palmer, when I first heard the name automatically, and, and then I guess it's just because I've been hooked on tattoos for years, I think of pinup models, you know, like Betty Boop and uh, I think Ella Page. Yeah, Ella Page and all those. So what kind of sprung on the train of horror for you at an early age not just at universal but before that um i think it i keep i always say this um but there's something about 90s kids growing up and i really mm -hmm. blame commercials and markets really pushing the halloween because i think at that point like big markets saw Halloween as all of a sudden lucrative in money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They never did before. It was just Christmas. So they always dedicated Christmas commercials and stuff. And then all of a sudden it switched and Halloween yeah. became a huge market, especially in candy. Candy started making personalized uh, Halloween commercials. And I don't know, there was something about the nineties that just, there was so much television, so much movies, so much resurgence for kids specifically targeted to kids as Halloween. So we kind of grew up on like monsters, like Goosebumps and Aureal Monsters and Are You Afraid of the Dark? And um, so I blame a lot of our childhood television shows kind of almost grooming us to be Halloween nerds. <laughs> so we were accustomed to it early. Yeah. And honestly, decorating the house for Halloween with my mom is probably some of the most precious times I've ever had. So I was always excited awesome. to go to Party City or something just to gather all the stuff and put up the spider webs out in the outside. We were the most decorated house on the block. And it oh, was cool. <laughs> a very special place in my heart. But I, but when you mix in vintage with that vintage came first and then Halloween came after. And if you notice in some of the vintage community, there's things called psychobillies and mm -hmm. rockabillies, mm -hmm. which is more of the Gothic kind of side. And you have to, realize where it kind of stems from is because the 1950s just like the 1990s pushed a lot of halloween stuff we had yeah. the monsters we had bewitched we had the adams family um so it was kind of like that base so you have now the vintage time and the vintage look with these monster type characters mm -hmm. uh, we hadn't really seen that and i would say until the 90s started again and then it pushed it so i think the horror and pinup and women and makeup and glamour and monsters have always been a thing together. I think now people are just finding a way to mix the two. And I certainly have, I was like, you know, what? why don't we do it? Why, why can't Frankenstein be pink? What's so wrong with that? Yes. So, yeah. I don't, that is, I don't yeah, that, that you make a really good point. Cause like when you think of creature from the black lagoon, you see that iconic picture of um i forget her name um i'll talk in my head yeah. yes and just with her you know white bathing suit and then i've seen like um julian anderson Very yeah J julian anderson did a um photo shoot with the monster she had on this like really cool red dress and it's like that it's very iconic very pinup like yeah yeah monsters and pinup girls like hammer films and yes the, those have always mm -hmm. really gone together and it's just such a beautiful blend. And I, I just love that people yeah. are catching on to it now and going, oh, we should push this. This is totally a thing. Yeah, exactly. if Julie Adams and Creature of the Black Lagoon isn't the most pinup thing I've ever seen in my life. They designed that swimsuit to make her look good. Like they padded her breasts, they padded her butt. Mm -hmm. they, I got the bathing suit, which was actually really risky at the time. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm kind of showing her in a certain light because technically out of all maybe the monster classic monster stories i would say creature is the biggest love story yeah. and yeah um not to mention uh marilyn monroe in seven year itch the famous scene where she's in the white dress mm -hmm. the movie coming out of is creature of the black lagoon so they've yeah they've always mixed so i was like oh i played marilyn and i like monsters that's same same yeah. vibes yeah, yeah. oh ab absolutely um, I was trying to think. All right, Jeannie, what other questions? I'm looking at my list of things. Well, when she's talking about the 50s version, like with Munsters and Adam's family and all those things, and, and then the trend 
it's picking back up in the 90s. I think part of the thing about the 50s is with the monsters, everybody fell in love with them because it, to me, it was like, hey, they're humanizing them totally. to the world. And then, and you were, you were bringing up the nineties and, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going to date myself because you basically are the same age as my niece. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, I was helped raising her in the nineties. Uh, so it, it's just, but the one thing that popped in my head was the Backstreet Boys, the monster, you know, the uh, song that they did where they're, dre- they're dressed up in the, the oh. outfit. Yeah. And those kinds of things. And I'm like, you know. I never thought about how they did that, but there was a lot of other things that the commercialized and everything started pushing towards the trend of Halloween again mm-hmm. and the monsters and marketing Halloween. Yeah, marketing yeah. Halloween. And I never even dawned on me that that was when it started picking back up again. And I can I see think, why. I think one of the main catalysts for that, if, if I am correct, I, I don't know the exact date, but I think one of the first people to do that or capitalize on Halloween as a lucrative money product was the beer companies when they signed on Elvira to do yep. Coors Light yeah. ads. Because, you know, they had beer ads only for Super Bowl. That's when they pushed it. Yeah. But they were mm-hmm. like, is Halloween an adult now kind of, is it for parties? Is Halloween now the day? And they started noticing college kids were getting <laughs> just as drunk on oh, yeah. Halloween and yeah. all of a sudden now this icon this woman to push this mm-hmm. and it worked it worked mm-hmm. everybody remembers those commercials with her and Coors Light and she's with all the monsters and stuff yes. and yes the big boards that were at the grocery store it mm-hmm. they made so much money on her it was insane and I think other companies saw that and they went ah okay I think we need to get on this trend what do we do yeah yeah, yeah. That, yeah thinking fast- about it in my opinion, like you're bringing it up, Elvira to me would be the perfect pinup model for Halloween. She's totally pinup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she is. I mean, she it's like she was designed that way to see, you know, not her specifically, but she designed herself that way when she became the character of Elvira. Mm-hmm. Sure. And so did she, Vampira too. You know, Vampira yeah. is the first horror host ever. Um, yep. she yeah. comes from the 1950s and based her character off of the Adams family comic. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. snatched away to the little like the high heels and the very vamp. Um, she was just more punk and beatnik than <laughs> maybe yeah. Elvira yeah. was. Yeah. But it, yeah, that's, that's what form. I was thinking. I'm like, yeah. But it just it just amazes me that you don't think of these things until they're pointed out like yeah. that. Because I would have never even imagined, because uh, I remember Elvira starting to push with the, you know, the beer industry in the 90s. Mm-hmm. But it's yeah. not something that just pops into my head saying, oh, that's that's when Halloween started gearing up again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, All of a sudden, so. Party. Yeah. yeah. Trendy. That's true. It, it, it's trendy. <laughs> Yeah. So let's so, talk about your Gwen Vu. I was about to bring up the David. same thing. It's a, kind of leading from horror host to horror host. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gwen Vu. Pronounce Zvengouli. it for me. I know Sven Gooley, but it's like so Gwen Gooley and then Gwen Gooley. Yeah. Gwen Gooley. That's right. It's just, I don't know why I can't get that. It's like stuck in my head. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, I was reading the Chicago Times, the Chicago Times article back from December that you that were interviewing for you guys. And so tell us a little bit about the audition process and how wonderful it is to actually work on such an iconic. I mean, and it's long lasting so oh boy, is it? <laughs> yeah so so give us some of that that good stuff right there yeah. um so i think my weird goal in life was always to be a horror host mm-hmm. and but unfortunately it really isn't a thing anymore so no. that's why i think i focused on youtube because that's the most like public access television show that we have today yeah <laughs> it's yep. like the modern way of it so that's why i kind of put everything on that and my friend, during uh, Halloween Horror Nights, I was in charge of Killer Clowns from Outer Space, The Maze. Mm-hmm. Cool. Those were my boys. And I remember I got a text message from a, my friend, and he was like, have you seen this audition? I think you should go. And I 
and lowered and behold, there it was, the Sanguli auditions um, that were open call. And um, I have a really funny story about that because <laughs> I was working Horror Nights, so I don't get home till about five o'clock in the morning. Ooh. And it was already October. And I was like, well, how long has this, have, have these auditions been up? Like, did I miss it? Yeah. What, when's the deadline? So I couldn't find anything anywhere on the website of like when the deadline was. So I was kind of panicking. So I remember in the middle of the night, I sent an email and I sent an email to every email that I could find connected to that site. Mm -hmm. um, little did I know I was actually sending an email to Rich Cause, Sven Gulli himself, like his personal email. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I wrote, I was like, hi, my name is Sarah Palmer. I would like to audition for the spawn of Sven Uh, I can't seem to find the deadline, no pun intended. Uh, but if you could let me know, <laughs> that'd be great. And thinking nothing of it, all of a sudden I have a ping on my email, like about 15 minutes later. Uh-huh. And it's Sven. He actually replied, like replied on his own email. Mm -hmm. And I say, I screenshot it because I have it to this day. Cause I'm like, if I get this job, I'm going to use this against him later. <laughs> out of all the things he could have said to me, maybe to help me with his own audition process or whatever, uh -huh. he literally just rep replied, no idea, period. <laughs> Thank you, Sven. <laughs> oh, that is hilarious. <laughs> so I screenshot I go, I remember this. I remember the great advice you gave me. Yes. <laughs> So a few months later, I send in a tape. I send it as myself. So I had no name, no character name. It was just Sarah Palmer okay. or Pinna Palmer. I'm not quite sure yet. And I think I was a vampire is what I originally did. Mm -hmm. um, got the call. I would say like six rounds in. Um, there was six rounds of auditions, which means wow. calls plus writing, testing. They wanted to test us on writing and comedy writing. Mm -hmm. or write a sketch for spend then write a whole episode choose any movie that you want write about it mine was creature of the black lagoon okay cool. uh did like facetime auditions too so like acting out the entire thing in front of them and then eventually getting the call to for them to fly me out to chicago to audition in the space um which was very nerve-wracking i've never been to chicago uh okay. and here i was and I still didn't have a name or anything. I was just, I think, Gwen or something, or no, sorry, just Sarah. And I actually show up, there was three people, I think, every day that month. So three different groups coming in, okay. mm -hmm. and being on the set. And they came in with their own stuff that they wrote. So whatever they gave us. And I actually happened to be on the same day that Scott Ryder is there, uh, who is now Imp on the show. Right. He's my mm -hmm partner crime yeah and out of like it it was so weird that we both got casted uh in this and we were both on the same day to the point where they i remember after i auditioned they were going through everybody else they sent the other girl home that day and they're like hey sarah can you can you hang around for a little bit i was like sure and they put scott and i together on the set and they're like you guys we just want to see something with you two um you guys both snuck into spend set go and they just had the cameras on us and we had to come up with an improv real quick of us sneaking mm -hmm. on a set and i think it was that moment where i started kind of realizing there might be more than one spawn and i was like oh i think they this together that's interesting yeah okay. so i thought i was done no not yet um <laughs> I have to call in another round uh and it was apparently the i was like so i have to go back to chicago for the final audition and this is when i showed up in kind of the gwen Gooley outfit that you see i was okay. like where i changed myself i started paling myself out i had a wig um mm -hmm. everything and i showed up but it still wasn't called gwen Gooley. i think i forget what my original name was but it wasn't that um okay uh because they came up with that name i did not Ah, okay. 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 There were a couple of names that they were circulating around, but yeah, I, I didn't. And um, that time they gave us two movies to pick from. And mine was Kolchak, the Night Stalker that okay. they gave me. Mm -hmm. And I had to write for not only me, but to write a bit for Sven and I. And I was like, you know what? Let's take a risk. Let's make a song. And I've never rehearsed the, the song with Sven. I never met Rich Cause. And, and this all of a sudden, here we are 
him and I have a song that we're singing together. I show up on set. I say hello to him and cameras are rolling and go. You're about oh, to wow. sing. Yeah, it was very <laughs> like, hope, hope this works out, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and eventually I got a call that we got it. And I was like, cool. And mm-hmm. they're like, by the way, we're airing that episode. What do you mean? You're oh, airing wow. it. <laughs> Well, we're airing your last audition. We're airing it, and I was like, "Okay, so good to know, I guess." And so that's why the first time anybody ever saw Gwen Dooley, I think at that point I I had the name. Mm -hmm. Um, It was my actually audition. So if I nervous and stiff and scared, and me singing with Sven, that was my audition. It was like a one and done, and that was it. And they aired it. Well, and they, they obviously felt it was good enough to be aired. So that's cool. I guess. But the problem is, I thought, you know, once you get hired, there'll be like a nice meeting and you get to be like, hey, let's discuss your character or maybe what we want you to do or yeah. how you're going to. What's your look? Here's your official name. Now, that never happened. So whatever I showed up with on that day, that outfit, that look. That's what I was. And now I'm stuck in this outfit and I'm going, okay. <laughs> and these, these gloves are getting more ill-fitted as time goes on. Cause they were mm-hmm. just supposed to be a one and done type thing. I, I didn't mm-hmm. think it. And now every time people see me with the old gloves, they just make fun of my old gloves. They're like, is she washing dishes? Yes. yes. And I've seen the comments. Like <laughs> to hate on my gloves. But now it's an ongoing joke that my old gloves are haunting Gwen. So they'll arrive in like different shots and they'll like beat people up and they have like, they're almost like, yeah, have a mind of their own now. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Are they yeah. like the equivalent of the rubber chickens that get, you know, they're the equivalent to them? thing in Adam's family. Okay. Yes. They, have, they have a cool, they're, but they're like twins. They work together, high five each other and they go away and it's become a thing, but that hasn't really been seen yet. That's the stuff we've been working on on the scene. Gotcha. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So that it was a long process, but it was well worth it. And we're still figuring out our characters too. And we, we, we only see Sven or Rich Cause when we film, you know, okay. and that's, yeah. Yeah. there's never been like a sit down convo with him. It's just like very. Yeah. I, <laughs> oh, wow. And so now do you do some of your own writing for your character? Yeah, we we have done a couple skits that are our own writing, but mm-hmm. um, we have been how do how do I describe this? There are, there is other stuff we have been doing on the side that has not aired yet. Gotcha. Okay, uh, that will be aired, uh, but our cast is work mostly focused on that, and mm-hmm. I would just say stay tuned for October. And oh, awesome. so okay. that's when everything we've been working on, I think will come into light. Um, okay. a lot of things, but and then the next day we film with Sven and sometimes he just writes a script for us and he goes, that's what you're saying today. And we're like, okay. And that's what people have been seeing. So like, we'll pop in on like random movies of his, mm-hmm. say a couple of lines on the teleprompter and then go away. And okay. that's, that's all it's been so far, so far. Okay. But, so it's evolving. <laughs> slowly evolving, but yeah, nothing that we've truly worked on yet has been seen yet. Okay. All right. Well, that I, I will be anxious to see that. Um, my husband and I, some Saturday nights, do sit down and watch it. We call it, you know, live. And then occasionally, other than that, we'll record it and then just watch it on a given night. And just, yeah. Same we, with my parents. Yeah. yeah they're excited to see. They got things to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, and it also depends upon what's being shown that night. Yes, I guess that's, that's why true. I I tune in because sometimes some of his movie selections are like, meh, no, nah, I'm just not in the mood. Oh, you know. Oh, and the fans make it very known that they do not want yeah. to watch, you know, uh, the trilogy of terror for the fifth time in a row. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, Somebody gets, gets a little redundant and little, you know, it's like, yeah, I really don't want to see it, but okay. <laughs> Doesn't mean I stop wanting to because I always yeah. tune in to see what's coming next. And I think that's one of the things that has kept Svenguli so 
cult classic over the years is that mm-hmm. the fan base is like, oh, yeah, may not want to watch it now, but I know it's going to be there when I do want to watch it. So, yeah. yeah, he he keeps the old classics alive and going. And that's what like he has access to some more like m- not modern, but I want to say like more 1980s horror films. OK, yeah. but, but I know Rich is very particular on what movies he wants to show. Yes. Um, he may okay. not like Friday the Thirteenth. Like, let's say we, we have access to that. Mm-hmm. He yeah. for doing Saturday the Fourteenth than yes. Friday the Thirteenth. Yeah, that's yeah. His style, and he tries to change it up every now and then. But certain contracts, um, when it comes to the movies, have to be shown in a certain period of time. So, let's say okay. trilogy of horror. Uh, their contract is, okay, yeah, you can have Trilogy of Terror for this amount of money, but you have to show it within a six-month period twice. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. That's why you're like, we just bought it. They have to contractually. Yeah, okay. so, yeah, I can understand that. I mean, that's yeah. just the business end of it. So you have to have to make do with those t- with type it. of things. Yeah, got to work it. You got to work it. And that's why I think we come in and, you know, those in-between bits that Sven has. Um, mm-hmm. We come in and we start to change it up a little bit. So it's like a different thing that you haven't seen before. So it, it depends on if people like us or if they don't like us. You can definitely hear the groans and moans and stuff <laughs> if we show up or if we don't or who is it. Um, yeah. and it's, it's fascinating seeing the fan base either accept, grow, kind of start to get to like, or just plain write us off. Uh, yeah. Because- it's scary. It, it's a weird, we're changing the game a little bit, but yeah. we're still going to keep the original core of it there. We don't yeah. ever want to give. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Some and of the I, fan base I can understand might have a little, have a little problem with some changing, especially oh, as yeah. long as Bengali has been around. Oh yeah. If I am correct, 1979 Rich Cause showed up. Yeah. And that, yeah. mind you, he is the son of Svenguli. There was even a Svenguli, Jerry G. Bishop before uh-huh. him. Yeah. Um, Which he was in even earlier. So, yeah, since 1979, he has been on the air. I mean, yeah, he's been fired from different local networks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. he's the longest running, I think, horror host actively working. I would say him and Joe Bob Briggs right now are like the last OGs still working, still on the air. Mm -hmm. Um, Two different styles. But, you know, Joe Bob is way more adult. And I think he's a little bit more family oriented for Spendley over here. Yeah, Absolutely. definitely so. Well, and I I really like the the Spawn edition. I think you guys bring a uh, you know a new element to the show, and I, I just we always my husband and I when we're watching. It's like who's going to show up tonight? You know when we're watching yeah. it. So it's just kind of it's fun to not not really know who is going to show up and interact. So yeah, it's like a trade every time. Sometimes it's all of us. You know, it depends yeah. on what Rich wants. Like well, like I said, those skits aren't really our control it's like we come in and either jim or rich writes it and we get it literally the day before sometimes Mm -hmm. while Mm -hmm. we're there in chicago and when i fly and we're sometimes i don't even know what i'm saying until i walk on that screen and go what am i doing oh this is a movie okay (laughs) and so if it looks like we're reading a teleprompter it's because we are yeah (laughs) it's hard Especially when there's all of us on screen and I'm supposed to be looking at somebody, but I can't because I don't know what my next line is. Right. So I'm trying to read it. It Uh it gets complicated, but they work like that. They have a system put in place. Jim and Rich, just they like to keep things going. They don't like it either when you mess up, because if you mess up, we got to start all the way at the beginning again. Right, right. You can see Rich start to get a little uncomfortable (laughs) with people. Yeah, well, I know uh, Jeannie and I were talking uh, before the before you came on tonight and about like the whole rubber rubber chickens. And I think Jeannie, didn't you read that somebody had been gifted chickens or rubber chickens or something? The guy that the guy that plays Imp. Yeah, he said that in the article that I was telling you from the Chicago Times, he told the reporter that his friends gifted him five rubber chickens when he got cast as imp. Probably. Yeah. (laughs) So I mean, mean, it's just kind of cool to think about rubber chickens because that's one of my, what's one of my favorites. I, my friend gifted me a rubber chicken years ago. And, and it was, it was used because of an article for road rage. 
You know, oh, if you gosh. ever have a problem of road rage, you keep a rubber chicken in your car. And then if somebody gives you a problem, grab that chicken and you shake it at them. And then it <laughs> makes them stop because they're trying to decide whether what in the world is this person shaking a rubber chicken at me or what? Don't be alone at that point. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's, it's just one of those things. So when I read that, I was like, oh, that's just too cool. I love it. The whole rubber chicken thing. So that's why I was asking you about it. So. Yeah, you should I'm see sorry. the box of rubber chickens Rich has in the back on the set. It's I just can't imagine all all different kinds. Some that look like they've been flattened on the side of the road. They have lost all their luster. <laughs> yeah, I, it, uh, I went on like what happened to mine. Yeah. He's not a puppet maker. He's probably the weirdest one out of our entire group. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's bizarre. I like I, him though interesting yeah. well um kind of like even going back further you know you mentioned like one of the like your best memories of halloween was decorating your house with your mom and stuff okay. so what what are the things that really brought you into the horror genre like from early on like that you were like i love this i, I want to see more and more of it and keep going with it. I guess that's what she's trying to say. It's yeah. kind of like, what's keeping you in this other than, you know, you talked about how you have YouTube about mm -hmm. pinup Palmer and you like bringing that into play. And, and I think I've even read some places where people um, have called you the Instagram influencer when it comes to that type of genre. And you've talked about how crossing it over with the pink. And I, yeah. I, I get it. <laughs> Every time I've seen any of your YouTube or Instagram or everything, I keep coming up with this Betty Boop, Jessica the Ra Jessica Rabbit, and all this rolled into an Elvira. And so yeah. it, it's it's wonderful to me. So, you know, what's keeping you on the track and what do you have for future, you know, for future horror coming up? Um, a lot of things. I'll I'll tell you that. But <laughs> I I don't know what attracts me to it so much. I don't know if it's the feeling I get. I'll, I'll tell you this, though. I love comedy more than most people. Like, mm -hmm. I, I love to laugh. I love to laugh. I love to be yeah. surrounded by laughter. And I don't know about you guys, but I've, I've heard this said a lot of times before. If you've ever gone to a horror film, like at a movie theater, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I always said, it's the only ones I go to a movie theater for is horror films, because I think you get more bang for your buck. And this is what mm -hmm. I mean. By that. Mm -hmm. Every time you get scared or you hear the audience gasp and when there's a jump scare, the next thing yeah. right after the scare is a laugh. Everybody oh, laughs because yeah. it's that relief of like, oh my gosh. And there's just something about that where I don't know if it's like an adrenaline kick or something, but I've always been addicted to that. And I've always been addicted to comedy and horror put together. I have to blame Mel Brooks for a lot of this uh, when it comes to Frankenstein or high anxiety oh yeah um, or brothers when it comes to certain horror films and student bodies that put these two things together um I, I don't know I just I never want to see it die because it was just such a time where camp was just it was just a way to make people feel good and feel yeah. funny and laugh and I feel like we lost that over time where it's just gotten too serious and Mm -hmm. I think that's why my YouTube videos, I'm always trying to make people laugh, even if I'm just doing a hair tutorial. There's yeah. something stupid happening in the background that has no business being there. You know, why is a bat on strings and a hair tutorial? I don't know, because I want it to be. Yeah. And it's uh, it's very horror hosty. It's the yeah. like the worse it is, the better it is. So I just try to keep comedy in my life. And comedy just happens to be horror in that yeah. sense. And I think that's what keeps me going. It, it makes me laugh. And there's so much more to explore because there's different, you know, engineers and whatever mm -hmm. our genre. Um, yeah. And what's coming next is <laughs> I wish I could tell you. I wish I could. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like I said, uh, around September, you'll start to hear some rumblings on, okay. I would say, the MeTV network. There's... Okay things shifting so that's something to look forward to september october mm -hmm. uh being an everybody that knows me knows that i can't spell for the life of me but here i am 
writing for to be an author for something horror that is coming out that you can own. Oh, nice. Uh, cool. okay. And so that, that's a first. I never saw that one coming when I was a kid. Uh, when you would write in your yearbook, <laughs> what you're going to do. Uh, but oh, yeah. something I definitely want to tackle. And I got a couple YouTube things and a reboot of my um, uh, my horror podcast. So I love okay. horror podcasts. I like talking to people who like horror stuff too. Yeah. And we're revamp of it this summer and then we're promoting it at Midsummer Scream. Oh, nice. Uh, okay. So we'll be there and I'll be there signing stuff or whatever. If anybody who just wants to come up and say hi. So cool. yeah. yeah, there's a lot of stuff, cool. but I, if I had a dream, you know, it would be to create something completely original. And I've been looking at, um, having like a Halloween record. Oh, so nice. uh, like Bobby for it in the Pinkett Smiths, you know, like the monster mash type music. Yeah. 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 Back really the horror host back in the day used to have a whole album all dedicated to like horror music and he would yeah. sing and do funny things. So I was like, I think I want to do something like that where it's like, a song, at least one of them have at least be a decent hit yeah. to play around Halloween time that everybody knows, oh, it's this one, you know, yeah. like to put in your Halloween records or whatever. So that's yeah, your playlist. Yeah. Cause I, 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 I created, I kind of borrowed people's on Spotify and then I was like, oh. I'm going to put my own together and pull the songs I really like. And so, yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah, that's what I've been kind of aiming for. And I want it to feel like those old 1950s, like yeah, all old thunder sounds and nice. Oh, very cool. Music. So very vintage still, but horror. So it's I want to do, I want to follow like Zachary's steps. Zachary, the horror host, is the one that I've been watching heavily and okay. watching his career and how he did it. Yeah. And um yeah, I, I want to follow kind of more in his footsteps. I just love being a horror host and I love that I get to be on a platform that still exists. Yeah. And I love because there isn't any. <laughs> I got, yeah. Well, um, I, I want to go back to what you were saying about comedy and horror and, you know, our, our podcast is based on Edgar Allan Poe and it, the six degrees are his influence on pretty much everything in so many different genres. People don't even realize besides horror and, when he wrote many of his horror short stories, really all of them, Jeannie, wouldn't you say they yep. all have this dark humor, you know, thrown mm -hmm. in here and there, like, you know, um, in the cask of Amontillado, when he's like, you're not going to die of a cold, you know, when, you know, Fortunato is leading or much stores leading Fortunato down to the cellar to wall him up, you know, and things like that. And so, yeah. you know, with what you were saying with, you know, the horror, the jump scare, and then that, that laugh afterwards, I mean, that to me, you know, has some influence from how Poe started out with, that's what the people wanted. That's why he wrote the horror. And so it just, I don't know, that just, that really kind of resonated with me, what you said. It, they always just like glamour girls and vintage and horror yeah. they can mesh a little together too comedy and horror always kind of been side by side yep and never taken seriously too you could see it in the academy awards why are these two things not up there because yeah. they're in the same yeah and i think that's maybe why people like freddy krueger you know because mm -hmm. here he is mm -hmm. the sinister scary thing and as each movie continues on he gets funnier he's wearing wigs mm -hmm. <laughs> he's <laughs> more ridiculous. And I don't know, people just became to love him as like a, almost a lovable character, a child yeah. murderer as a lovable character. How did that yeah. happen? He's the anti-hero. Yeah. He's definitely yeah. the, the anti-hero. Yeah. yeah so you're rooting for him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I and know. Just like what you were talking about with music, like the horror type music, the first mm -hmm. thing that popped into my head when you were talking was the Freddy Krueger nursery thing one, oh, one two, two coming. freddy's coming for you mm -hmm. three and i was thinking that's perfect because that's that's from my day i won't say <laughs> child childhood Jeannie, Jeannie, but that's we're, from we're my old day. We're, we're, yeah. we're a decade older uh, than you <laughs> <Sarah. laughs> you know from the best kind you know what i'm exactly. saying exactly <laughs> that's, so that's that's the I thing and <laughs> that's why i have a real hard time with some people that mark horror on some of their movies because i go that's not horror 
you yeah. know that that doesn't fit with horror i mean all you're doing is just causing nothing but you know bloodshed and you seeing how gore. much gore yeah. yeah i'm like there's a difference between gore and horror yeah and you know that that's the thin line that, that people have to walk and that's one of the things i think that's kept sven uh so stationary mm -hmm. with the types of movies that even if he does repeat them so many times and has to it's the choices of those movies because like you said they they fit a a place in our hearts that make it horror to us not gore but horror an actual horror com you know comedy relief type it's thing so that yeah, yeah you got to have um, that and you know and that's why it, it yeah. was great but yeah. i think that's also the the change that's kind of happening now when they're starting to look at us, the Sven squad. Mm -hmm. And um because like back in the 50s, Psycho came out, right? Or 1960s, oh, yeah. 1950s. Yeah. Scary, the scariest thing ever. Mm -hmm. But if you move all of a sudden to the 1970s, Psycho looks like nothing, especially yeah. when Exorcist came out. Exorcist, yep. everybody was people oh, were throwing yeah. up. Yeah. Okay. Well, now Exorcist, if I showed somebody Exorcist today, they'd be like, is this scary? And you're like, it was. Like, it's yeah. huge. Yeah. For these, back then, this was disturbing. Like, yes. and I could still see some disturbing parts. So now with the Spence Squad, it's like, well, what kind of movies do we show? Like, what, you know, to people in the 19, you know, early 1970s or late 1970s when the first Friday the 13th came out, I mean, it's just mm -hmm. a killer mother. Yeah. To, yep. But now, is it camp? Is it camp? Pun intended with the camp. It's like, yes, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> consider that. You know, is it the same now as maybe the classic monsters? Because we look at all the B films from the 1960s and 50s and just laugh mm -hmm. at them. Mm -hmm. That's what makes them great. Now we're starting to reach a point where almost it's catching up to the 1970s and 80s as the new yeah. bracket of making fun of these films. Because if you do look back, Killer Clowns is ridiculous. It yes. Is absolutely mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah it's starting to shift and move again because horror are getting a little bit more crazier as time goes on something happened in the late 90s early 2000s i i blame saw i blame texas chainsaw and i even blame hellraiser mm -hmm. to start yeah, to yeah. amp up the blood and gore and everybody's trying to top and level up with each other it became like what can we disturb you with the most i, um, I agree with and you now it's shifting again too. yeah but it's so you used to think was scary maybe to us so of going do we show it like is it funny can we make fun of it yeah yeah it's crazy times are changing it really is well one uh question we always ask um all of our guests is where like where did you first like meet edgar Allan poe was it in middle school high school like where did you like maybe read your first I don't remember oh, anything in school. Nothing. Okay. Because I mm -hmm. that's not where I learned things. I learned everything from the TV. Okay. And <laughs> you're gonna laugh at this. <laughs> but the first time I ever got introduced into kind of an Edgar Allan Poe world was I have to blame Simpsons trilogy of Treehouse, Treehouse yes, of Terrors. Yes, yes. Well, the, the first, first, first one. Episode. Yeah. Yeah. And that was kind of the first, I would say, tidbit of kind of going, is this a poem? what is this? You know, and figuring out you know, in class, you learned things, but that was, I would say that was the first thing. Okay. And really though, in, I would say early freshman year of high school or even end of middle school, there's a place called not scary farm. Yes. Uh, which is a park here. And they have just like universal studios, Halloween Horror Nights. It's, it's their horror event. They're the OG ones that created the first like haunt. Lyra used to do her shows here. This is the place. And one year they actually had an Edgar Allan Poe maze and it was oh, dedicated cool. to all his, uh, all his writings, all his books, the pendulum, the pit, the pendulum. Mm -hmm. And they had, so every room, it was dedicated to a murderer that was inspired by Edgar Allan Poe's song or poems or writings. Yeah. So every room went in, it was, a different kill dedicated so the murderer is like oh he's reading you the stories as you're going through the maze and watching people get sliced by the pendulum or oh that's the, cool the crows everywhere. Yeah, yeah it was that was another thing that i 
strictly remember. Oh, that's neat. <laughs> Simpsons. <laughs> Once again, cartoons. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but I, I will say the Simpsons version the Simpsons. of the Raven is very cool. Like they did an excellent job with it. They really did. Yeah, and that's one of the they things stopped. that connect our podcast. That's it. Yeah, they did the actual. Yeah, and that's why we uh, we like to do our podcast because even though Edgar Allan Poe is 214 years ago, he's still very much a part of it. <laughs> the Simpsons and and people get introduced to him different ways. That we even brought up how he's in comics like Batman oh, yeah. and stuff. Mm-hmm. So oh. it, it's good to hear that. Hey, it, it's not that people get introduced to Poe in school, like you said. Mm-hmm. You know, not a lot of people remember school that far back, anyway. And so, hey. It's good to know that, hey, it, our influences that we're covering are showing that that's how people are getting the Poe influence anyway. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah. I think even uh, when we were talking about like Hobby Lobby and Joanne's and stuff, didn't they have like a whole Edgar Allan Poe theme one year? Yes. Yeah. Michael's has been doing that for the past two years. And I'm hoping they'll continue that with some of their merchandise here for this year. Victorian macabre kind of. I remember a statue of him. Yes. Yes. Oh. It was really cool. And in fact, I was going to order it and they yeah. were sold out <laughs> before <laughs> Like the day they came out. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. I think I need to find a picture of my dad during Halloween. I, th- I believe he dressed up as Edgar Allan Poe and then decorated his entire cubicle with like the crows everywhere and stuff. I have to find the picture. Oh, it nice. happened like five years ago. <laughs> it's <laughs> why he did it. I don't know. Like he reads poems, you know, but he decided to do it anyway. I I don't know. Oh, that's my dad's cool. Right yeah. <laughs> that is really cool. Well, and I, and I think June fifteenth, uh, Spanguli showing Pit in the Pendulum by Poe, and so and I think you said that you're going to be on that episode. I am. Yeah. Okay. Gwen. Awesome. The reason how he's been writing Gwen lately is a little bit kind of like um, since she is from Hollywood and she's buried amongst the stars at Hollywood Forever. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Like a celebrity wants to know everybody's business, almost kind of like Lucy, you know, yeah. like oh. Yeah. Get in the show. Can I get a part of this? Can I meet this celebrity? Yeah. And so every so she's kind of dumb. So when she hears Pitt and Pendulum, she thinks he's talking about Brad Pitt. And where is it? <laughs> that's so, right. <laughs> that's kind of the direction. And sad news for Gwen later when she finds out it's not what she thinks it is. Yes. Um, but, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. A pit full of rats is definitely not Brad. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't know yeah oh that's great well sarah thank you so much for joining us this has been amazing and this has been awesome and we look forward mm-hmm. to what you have in store for your po- new new br- rebranded i should say podcast and <laughs> when Gooley's future and everything else you do thank you. So, thank you are you going to be on spike's breezeway cocktail hour anytime soon <laughs> i we text each other as the show is going because mm-hmm. you know my whole thing is i give him crap all the time i really oh, yes, do yes yes and, that's that's gr- and it's great on the, the episodes <laughs> Friend of me, and uh, but uh, there's a couple exciting things in store for him that I know that I'm not going to mention. Yeah, that I may have some involvement with, but okay. will I be on? He always he always acts like I live so far away, but and he gives me crap all the time for not being on a show. I was like, you're the sp- you're supposed to ask me. It's not me yes. just going. Yeah, I'm going to show up to your house. Yeah, even though I've already <laughs> stated that I've hidden in the background somewhere or like in his garage, shackled up. Oh yes, I like to make things complicated for him. But I, I would say soon, soon when he probably gets back from uh, the Hookie Lao. Okay. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's another thing too. That's, I keep telling, I was like, we need to do a Creature of the Black Lagoon one or something, or let's oh, do yeah. Gilligan's Island theme. Like, let's all dress up, get Biff. That would or- be amazing. That would be so much fun. Yeah, it's just like pulling teeth because he's so busy now because this is his job. This is his I know, life. I know. And we were so excited for him for that. So it's really all cool right. to watch him grow. Very yeah. proud of him. Yes, absolutely. Jeannie, do you have anything else before we end? Nope. Everything is good for me. All right. Well, Sarah, thank, thank you, you Sarah. again. And Jeannie, we are, we are out. out. <laughs>